everyone uh, so today uh, we have joined again uh, for this uh, isprs and isrs webinar on uh, hydrosphere and cryosphere and today we have popularly known as the SWOT mission, along with the uh, Crystal uh, and Sentinel-6 project at NASA's uh, JPL. And uh, all these uh, projects have a very strong components of uh, microwave remote sensing, especially the altimeters, uh, especially uh, the advancements like the synthetic aperture altimeters and interferometric, uh, 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 interferometric altimeters. And he has held various positions, senior positions of technical Uh, Ajusa uh, Pacific uh, University. So it's our privilege and honor uh, from uh, ISPRS as well as Indian Society of Remote Sensing side uh, to uh, invite you for this uh, talk on uh, uh, recent innovations in remote sensing of oceans and inland waters. So Dr. Waze, over to you. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to come and talk to your group about uh, the SWAT uh, mission. Um, I'm gonna try and uh, uh, project my slides and uh, we can get started. I'm going to give you a, a very, very fast uh, history and status on SWAT um, in about a little less than one hour, what has taken us uh, almost 20 years <laughs> to build. So I will do my best, uh, just one moment. Okay, so um, thanks again for for having me. Uh, my, uh, you know, I have been uh, managing the SWAT project um, basically since concept all the way until now, and it's taken almost twenty years. Um, what makes me really passionate about the SWAT mission is I, I care deeply about uh, water and uh, how precious of a resource that is, and so anything we can do to improve our knowledge about uh, this precious resource is something I think is extremely valuable. And remote sensing from uh, space gives us a, a very unique vantage point to make um, uh, a strong contribution towards uh, measuring and monitoring this precious resource. So SWAT is, um, is making the first global survey of Earth's surface water observing the fine details of the ocean's surface topography and measuring how continental water bodies change over time. Um, the key innovation for SWAT is really enabled by um, its wide swath uh, altimetry um, technology that's being flown, particularly for this application for the very first time. Uh, and uh, the objective is to cover the Earth's oceans, uh, large lakes, rivers, reservoirs and, um, and measure them at any point um, over the, the global uh, environment oh, at least once every 21 days. So with SWAT, um, I used to say we will detect ocean features uh, at least 10 times better than and uh, at better resolutions than current technologies. Now we are doing that. In fact, we're doing it uh, even much better than our uh, initial requirements that we had specified for the mission. And I'll, I'll show you much more in terms of results. Um, we launched the project um, into space in December of 22. And ever since then, um, the mission has been operating uh, quite well. And I'll show you very quickly the whole history, uh, pretty much from concept to today, uh, very fast in, in this uh, talk. 
So um, I won't talk too much about um, the, the specific motivations behind SWAT, but uh, just to say that uh, it, we've had um, two particular uh, science thematics that we've been um, approaching, and, and that's our primary objective with SWAT, which is on ocean uh, mecha mechanisms at very small scales um, and, and mesoscale to look for mesoscale eddies, ocean and atmosphere coupling, and ocean biology and dynamics, which is our overall science objectives. Of course, we're effectively really measuring sea surface height and to infer the science and the science objectives that um, I'm mentioning here. But then the other key innovation, we've had lots of altimetry missions, which I've been involved with for the past 20 years, really looking at the open ocean and coastal, uh, not so much on hydrology. So uh, this was a key objective and I think a key breakthrough uh, with the SWAT project on hydrology in particular in looking and helping us um, understand uh, and determine the water flows and stocks across continents, which we think um, as people and scientists start uh, particularly analyzing the data from SWAT, we think is going to have a significant benefit for the environment to help manage uh, extreme events. And then of course, to better understand um, and manage uh, water and, and of course food that and, and life that's really associated with water. So this is um, something that I saw uh, when we first started and proposed um, SWAT. And on the left side, you'll see it's one of the very high resolution models um, called ECHO here at JPL in terms of the ocean models. And uh, I saw this for the very first time and it looked fantastic, amazing. And I always wondered what, um, you know, our actual observations from space will, will look like, and you'll see later on um, with real results from SWAT, it looks very similar, but uh, the, the uh, real power of SWAT is what's happening at the very high resolutions and small scales. Um, on the other side, um, we have never really looked at uh, measuring global rivers, uh, you know, all across the continents. There's lots and lots of um, measured uh, in situ measurements um, in, in various places, but there are also many, many, many places across the world where there are very, very few um, in situ measurements and, and consistent measurements. And so SWAT's objectives, particularly on hydrology for rivers, uh, the requirement was 100, 100 meter type uh, rivers, and uh, we really are observing much, much smaller uh, river, rivers and water bodies, and I'll show you uh, thing in terms of results again coming up very soon. So this is how SWAT kind of got started. Um, it wasn't actually even 20 years ago. It was um, back in 1978. Um, you know, some of the basic technologies we're using today, like altimeters on SAR uh, radars, were demonstrated with the CSAT mission. Unfortunately, the mission didn't last very long. Um, yeah, I think it, it only lasted a few months, but the results in terms of demonstrating a capability were tremendous and something that was applied um, with missions um, subsequent to that. So one of the particular missions um, that relates to SWAT and its um, SAR interferometric uh, radar um, was linked to um, the, the year 2000 shuttle radar topography mission, which JPL uh, developed, which was, uh, uh, in a sense, a, a very similar version of what we uh, ended up with on SWAT with the interferometric radar system that was deployed from uh, the space shuttle. Um, its objectives were completely different for land topography. And, uh, but basically that's when sort of the idea started on whether we could use this for measuring sea surface heights and water heights. And uh, that was then progressively studied, developed, demonstrated, and um, a key um, person that, that really is sort of the father of this instrument is um, Dr. Ernesto Rodriguez here at JPL. Um, and what you see today from SWAT isn't actually the first concept. We, we actually proposed and even um, pretty much built a, a very uh, crude demonstration version on uh, the Jason 2 mission. It never ended up flying. We got past the CDR 
but uh, unfortunately ran out of funding uh, and, and didn't happen. However, we learned a lot in terms of the basic um, capabilities, technologies, and what we thought we would need for a future dedicated mission, um, which then became SWAT as uh, it is today. So here um, on the left is kind of um, our, our uh, sketch of what we planned in back in 2003 with the Jason 2 mission with what was called White Swat Ocean Altimeter. Uh, I was managing this project. It was extremely exciting to demonstrate this new technology while having the traditional Nader altimeters also on board. Um, and then we, we sort of translated that and scaled that to a dedicated um, mission on SWAT, which we, I would say, really kicked off in 2008 uh, in terms of more seriously looking at a uh, configuration and a design. Um, and even today, uh, since 2008 and now launched in 2022, um, the design hasn't changed that much. However, if you continue and kind of notice um, from what you see on the sketch here versus what we ended up realizing in, in real life, um, there are uh, subtle but important differences. For example, the mast that we had here, which, which was a deployable mast, the, we realized that it was, it was not going to be stiff enough for our particular application. We really needed very high stability, very high stiffness, very high thermal stability. And um, the design of that mast and boom system was completely different, but in effect, the measurement system was um, uh, basically the same using um, interferometric technology and uh, transmitting um, signals from each of the two antennas over a 10 meter baseline. So here's, um, you know, our challenge was, of course, um, we came up with that mission, um, we sized that mission, we costed that mission, we thought it would take uh, almost a billion dollars um, to actually build not only the complete flight system, but we really needed a very high performance ground system uh, to take all of the data, capture it, downlink it, process it, uh, and we're generating huge amounts of data. The, the onboard uh, continuous data rate on board with just the, the radar, which the new radar, which we call Karen, K A band uh, interferometric SAR altimeter, um, is generating uh, about 360 megabit per second continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we needed to come up with a system um, that we could afford. And in the end, um, we um, established a major partnership with CNES, the French Space Agency, to really uh, see how we could join forces and make this mission happen. Fortunately, we, we had very good um, partnership uh, in, the, in the end with CNES um, <clears throat> and could share and, and combine our common uh, knowledges, capabilities, resources, um, and in all levels. I've worked with CNES um, since 1992 from Topex Poseidon on every mission. And I would say this is a, a highlight in terms of the amount of partnership and cooperation we had on every aspect of the mission, right from the payload to the spacecraft, to the operations, to the downlink systems, to the processing, every element, uh, CalVal science, every element of the project um, has partnership and really needed partnership to make it happen uh, and to be able to downlink the data, process it, control it, um, exchange it. And, and then um, a lot of the uh, ground system in particular, in terms of the algorithms, uh, particularly for the hydrology were brand new. Uh, nobody had actually prepared algorithms for this application. So um, almost every aspect of the project um, involved either technologies or development um, where we were really going back to very basics and developing forward for this, uh, this application, including an airborne system that you see to the right um, called AirSWAT, um, which uh, we built, flew, and is still flying. Uh, to continue supporting the, the mission science going forward. So here's a view, uh, a little bit of a zoom of the spacecraft. Um, uh, as I'm telling you this very, very fast, um, 
Uh, I won't be able to describe all of the features, but really the highlights are what we call the payload module, which is the top third of the spacecraft. And then it's divided further, what you see there, into what we call the Nader module, which basically houses all of the traditional heritage instruments. So with SWAT, we really tried to have the traditional altimeter uh, and, and instrumentation with the radiometer, altimeter, and, and some of the support equipment for precision orbit determination. And at the same time, have the brand new measurement technology with, uh, with Karen. And that's what you see now here in the uh, larger and lower qu quadrant of the payload module. Um, this module was packed with electronics with um, you know, very new developments, particularly for the high voltage power supply, for the radio frequency unit, for the digital subsystem, um, and uh, basically be able to package it, uh, keep it stable, and, uh, and then have uh, the deployment systems as well to be able to, to uh, ultimately make the measurement. So here are some of the the engineering, um, I, I would say, achievements and firsts, um, particularly uh, that were developed uh, at JPL. JPL was in charge of developing the overall payload and payload module. Absolutely, we had contributions from uh, from Kness, very important contributions, both in terms of some of the instruments, the the Karen, one of the important Karen subsystems. We also had some contributions from the Canadian Space Agency. But uh, the overall design uh, integration and bulk of the manufacturing integration tests were um, done here at JPL. So some of the items uh, I mentioned about, a, uh, this is a very high power radar uh, and uh, we have a two kilowatt system just for the radar itself, uh, deployable antenna with very tight uh, alignment and stability requirements um, that we needed to meet. Um, for this particular application where we were trying to do hydrology and oceanography, um, we had kind of a compromise orbit where we are in a uh, non-sun sink orbit. So uh, a lot of the designs uh, were very challenging with very uh, dynamic thermal environments and power environments. And uh, so the sizing and technologies that we needed to, to fit were really uh, challenging to keep the thermal stability, uh, as I said, very, very tight stability, a large uh, reflect array system also that um, I think was the, one of the first in the, of its kind for this application. And even the downlink system with X-Band, uh, particularly that we had at the time without any gimbal mechanisms because we were trying to keep everything very, very stable on board uh, and not moving. Uh, so some of these were, were the key enabling technologies um, for SWAT. Um, I'm not going to go over the schedule. This is a very high level version just to tell you the history a little bit in terms of what happened. Um, of course, we started, as I said, back in, I would say very actively back in 2010, 2011 with the full project as is. Ended up, um, of course, having lots of challenges, some delays, um, but it was all worth it. Um, one of the significant challenges, of course, was COVID. Uh, which was right happening right in the middle of our payload development, but uh, we overcame it. And, and uh, uh, actually with our partnership, we built the payload here at JPL with some deliveries from Kness. We integrated everything. We shipped the payload to France, did a full integration with uh, a Kness provided spacecraft platform, did the full testing, shipped it back to the US uh, for a launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 that uh, NASA provided. So lots of moving pieces along with uh, the technologies and programmatics to, to make um, the, the full mission happen and make uh, it happen uh, on, on, I would say, a challenging timeline and on budget. So one of the difficulties we, of course, had was COVID. Everybody had. We weren't the only ones globally. Um, but this is a view of the, of, uh, the Karen module, only the Karen module that you see, and it's really packed with electronics, cabling, everything that you need to build typical space hardware. And then we, uh, we were also had uh, this whole deployment system, which it turned out to be that uh, doing a lot of the 1G ground testing was probably more difficult than the overall space deployment. But obviously, you have to do it, deploy it, and uh, get confidence in the whole thing. 
during COVID, it was particularly difficult because we also had French teams here that we needed. Um, they, uh, they had to go back to France. We set everything. We were not geared for remote operations. We totally changed our uh, operations and integration activities with GSEs that we were able to set up remotely and, and basically um, conducted the whole integration and test uh, program remotely and successfully in the end. And uh, here's sort of some beauty shots of uh, the payload module. The payload module is big. I would say it's, uh, it's roughly about um, three and a half, four meters tall and about um, three meters wide in, in sort of a cube. And this is in a, a stowed configuration that you see here um, in, in, at JPL before we basically shipped it to, uh, to France. So of course we, we were able to ship it, we were able to integrate it. There you see on the, on the right-hand side, integrated the payload module integrated with uh, the spacecraft bus. The spacecraft bus was also something that was, um, I would say, tailored, customized for SWAT because um, CNES um, had, had their contractor Talus Linea Space in, in Cannes uh, come up with a customized design, which was kind of a hybrid of um, um, a high performance um, optical sorts of um, uh, payloads that uh, and applications that they had with uh, higher power systems that they typically employed for telecommunication satellites. So um, we really needed a, um, a somewhat customized solution and we were able to do that, made it and, and then go through the typical uh, environment integration test uh, and environmental test program in France, which took about 14 months of quite intense activities, again, all through COVID. So I'm not gonna go through all of that, but I think everyone knows the uh, difficulties and restrictions and constraints that um, that COVID had on the, on the whole world. Uh, but that was overcome. Uh, SWAT has been a program um, of, of challenges continually. I won't tell you the every single one of them, I would say more recent ones. And we, we felt quite happy that we got through that, but then um, ran into another problem, which was that because of the Ukraine war, the Antonov aircraft was no longer available and we could not find anything else to basically ship the spacecraft. So within um, a few months, I would say four months, we were able to work with the US Air Force to use their largest um, cargo carrier, which was specifically set up for very large payloads like uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. And we had to completely design a whole um, loading scheme um, and we barely, barely, barely fit. It was a huge airplane, but uh, as you can see on the left, we not only got the spacecraft on board, but we had to carry the whole complete uh, tractor and trailer system on board to make everything work. But we, again, had really strong cooperation this time, not only with, uh, with the French, but also with the US Air Force. So we launched. Was a, uh, I've done five launches, four of them with SpaceX, and every single one is um, breathtaking and heart-stopping and nervous. But uh, the launch itself, of course, goes well, but then we just move on to our, um, our uh, I would say, minutes and, of, and, and uh, moments of terror. Um, and for us, right, we launched and, and the spacecraft, everything was going well. And then the first real big thing for us was the, the antenna deployment, which I'm, I think you'll see an animation of it coming up here a, a second. We actually had cameras on the payload that uh, thankfully allowed us to actually see the deployment in, in space. That gave us a lot of comfort, but also anxiety as we were doing this. We ended up doing step by step by step um, over the course of about one week for the whole deployment on, on both sides. Which, uh, which ended up going extremely well. Um, again, thanks to a lot a lot of detailed planning and practice. So here you see uh, animation very, very fast. This is not real life uh, in terms of speed. There you see how the, the arms of the mast um, you know, deploy. And, and then we did that all while we were uh, in sort of a safe configuration and then ultimately moved the spacecraft to its nadir pointing, earth pointing configuration, and then turned on the payload. 
um, which obviously, which uh, is the most important part of ultimately realizing um, success. So uh, I'm not a radar engineer, um, but this was uh, something I remember that um, our radar team uh, ran to my office to show me the excitement from this. Um, but, uh, you know, I could understand the excitement because um, right out of the box with no adjustments, uh, they were seeing really, really good and strong results from um, the, the brand new radar system. Uh, one of the keys to making this measurement um, happen practically is that uh, I mentioned before, we're generating a tremendous amount of data, but um, we uh, to, to be able to make that manageable, we decided that we were gonna have an onboard processing, data processing system um, for all of the ocean data. So. It's not a compression system. It's an onboard data processing system. So basically our level zero, level one product, you know, for the ocean effectively is produced onboard and downlinked and, and uh, very, very complex um, uh, high tech system that we have. Um, and uh, to do this all at the speed of the data that's being collected uh, on board. So to our knowledge, that's the first um, demonstration of this kind of technology to have an onboard generated uh, interferogram that's computed and, and then directly downlinked. And that has helped um, even the utilization of this data tremendously. And then the rest of the, the data, which is really the hydrology data that we, we uh, do, um, uh, do some compression on to make it manageable, but the rest of it is, is basically directly downlinked and processed uh, on the ground. Um, this is another image um, that I saw of the of the radar power returns um, shortly after, um, you know, our some of our first uh, data takes that we have. And, um, you know, this is of Long Island, New York. And um, as I was looking at it, of course, it looks fantastic. But what's really fantastic is we were looking for water features and, and being able to detect water it's something like a uh, hundred meter wide sort of water features. And we're seeing um, basically boat docks and, and very, very clearly being able to measure and see water uh, features that were 30, cent 30 meters or sometimes even smaller than that. So we knew pretty much that the performance of the, 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 the basic intrinsic performance of the radar was, was operating extremely well that we were seeing. Um, you know, then I started seeing we had teams as we were doing this, uh, we, we had teams, um, I would say about in seven, seven to 10 different places uh, globally in, in different places across the world. Um, we had a, a small team in New Zealand um, actually in situ looking and taking in situ data while SWAT is over flying. Um, one of the hydrology features, which the hydrologists actually did not think we would get useful data, was on these so-called braided rivers. Um, this particular one it was in New Zealand, and there's more pictures and in situ measurements that particularly show its challenges and channels and water features. And um, you know, SWAT is able to detect these extremely well which um, the community seems to be very, very happy about because this was a bonus. This is not something they really expected. In fact, we sent a team there mostly to understand um, what uh, we, we probably had challenges to measure and or uh, to try to see if we can come up with algorithms that might make the best of the data we did collect, but um, it, it shows extremely good results. So this is our um, first light image um, from SWAT, and I think um, it illustrates very well um, what um, the capability that SWAT is providing, particularly in terms of high resolution, wide SWAT, high accuracy measurements. Um, on the left is, is a panel, basically a composite panel with um, all of the, the active uh, nadir altimeters, seven of them, uh, you know, being processed with the Copernicus Marine Service. And on the right with one single swath measurement from SWAT. And I think it's obvious in terms of the clarity and resolution that uh, SWAT is providing and all in, in one track 
uh, in a very wide swath. So um, I think it's uh, fulfilling, certainly fulfilling um, its uh, promise that uh, we started out with, uh, with the basic uh, specifications and concept. So this is another one of my favorite panels to kind of illustrate that. This is one we're looking at the standard Nader altimetry with four satellites with, um, and this is sort of what, what uh, you might see. You'll see how the composite image builds up. This is one with uh, 10 satellites um, that we have from the traditional Nader altimetry. And, and then of course, this is what we have from SWAT um, in terms of the radar <clears throat> images that we're getting um, with very, very good returns and very good resolutions. Um, and that has, uh, of course, uh, been supporting our primary objectives in hydrology and, and in uh, oceanography, but <clears throat> we think is going to enable a, a whole host of other uh, synergistic science and applications, which I'll tell you about, um, or at least give you a, a few samples of uh, in a couple of minutes. So I showed you in the beginning um, what um, the ECHO model uh, was, was showing in terms of the prediction. There it is on the left again. Um, and um, I'm always blown away looking at uh, all of the, the, the fine scale dynamics that are happening in the ocean. And then this on the right hand side is what you see from SWAT. And uh, obviously it's not exactly the same and it's not intended to be the same, but what you can see is those fine scale features actually existing in, in real life and as measured by, by SWAT. Um, so uh, this is a, a really good um, and easy uh, visualization of um, what we thought is happening versus what is happening. And I think uh, already the scientists are using the as measured data to find and improve and correct uh, some of our models that we've been developing for decades uh, already with the, with the data and the returns from SWOT. So here you see um, sort of a movie with, um, with uh, the SWOT data. And, and again, um, uh, sort of ignore the, the rivers systems that you see here. Those are just sort of uh, drawn in graphically, but I'm gonna show you hydrology data uh, later on. So this is um, you know, a composite map from uh, SWOT data, from SWOT Karen data. And uh, you can see again, a lot of uh, really fine scale features that, that we're able to observe globally. But, um, you know, as we, as you really, really, really need to look closer and uh, what you can see from SWAT. So I'm gonna forward this a little bit so that uh, you, can, you can see a little bit closer in terms of what's happening. And uh, the appreciation of what's happening with SWAT is really, really, having to go much smaller and kind of zoom uh, much closer to the, to the features that um, I think are gonna be extremely important to the scientists, both locally, regionally, and also globally. So here's, um, again, one of my favorites that kind of um, blew me away uh, in terms of looking at those fine scale features um, and what's happening both in terms of elevations and um, their derivatives in terms of slopes and currents. So uh, this is really where I'm, I'm hearing from the scientists that uh, the magic and, and uh, that SWOT data can provide towards a, a really breakthrough understanding of what's happening with the ocean, what's happening with the mixing, what are, are there interactions along the coasts um, and inland waters, and how also this uh, uh, affects uh, ocean mixing, which has all kinds of uh, scientific um, uh, implications for climate science as well. So uh, here's some of the images um, I, I actually picked out from the latest SWAT science team meeting. So we had um, a science team meeting now roughly a month ago <clears throat> in the middle of, uh, of June. Um, it was an extremely exciting science team meeting, not only because we had new results, um, on the, on the basics for oceanography and hydrology, but really some very interesting results on the other synergistic science and, and, and some features that have never been observed. And one of those features that I hear a lot of excitement about is about internal tides. Um, 
and I want to warn everybody, I'm not a scientist. So I think uh, I can refer you to our project scientists who can talk for hours and explain things in details. And, and we're happy to do that. Uh, but these uh, sorts of features for uh, the internal waves and also the, the surface swell waves is something we were not able to observe before. Um, I didn't mention this to you earlier, but for SWAT, we, we have, um, we sort of plan the post-launch operation, um, I think very thoughtfully, where we, we operated for the first six months of the mission in a one day repeat and strategically plan that so that uh, this one day repeat was overflying daily uh, some in situ Calval sites that we had set up on land, on water, on ocean, um, in, in various places across the world. And, but that uh, was really powerful in terms of directly comparing the SWAT performance with in situ truth, let me call it. But some of the repeat uh, you know, um, measurements that were able to be done daily uh, allowed some of this unique science um, that none of our existing altimetry missions have been able to do and observe before. So it's something to think about as we, we think about the future and how those um, applications can be further uh, exploited. Um, this is another graphic that I love. Um, this is from um, our, uh, our team that we sent um, to Alaska. Alaska has a lot of very unique um, water features and particularly river systems and very complex river systems. And um, uh, this was led by one of our uh, lead PIs, uh, Dr. Tamlin Pavelski at University of North Carolina. He and his team were in Alaska and, um, you know, he has been working with us during the whole development of the mission and had was optimistic, but basically he was expecting to see returns on these main channels um, with the river that you see sort of transecting the slide. And all the other water features that you see all over the place, hundreds, thousands of them, <coughs> were not something we expected to see. So, uh, you know, I think uh, right now in our standard data products we have, we are, of course, producing products for the standard um, uh, river systems that we knew of a priori. But um, you know, SWAT is, of course, um, providing data in all places. And um, I think there's going to be a tremendous um, set of applications and exploitation um, of, of the data, even well beyond the standard data products that we have. And in fact, um, I think something we hope to do is, is basically produce our own new water database over the course of the next uh, year or two on a, on a global scale. So one thing I hadn't seen actually until about a month ago was I'd seen lots of data uh, in terms of what's happening on particular uh, river system or particular river, particular channel, particular reservoir but not what was happening globally. So this is uh, some work from Dr. Jita Wang uh, at University of Illinois. Um, and he produced this uh, global look at the measured mean surface, uh, mean water surface elevation on global lakes um, over the course of four months uh, using about four months of data. And not only was he able to to process the data and utilize it and look at the, the elevations, but um, the elevation performances were, were quite good from all the comparisons that uh, he, he and other teams um, have done. So this is gives, um, and this is with, again, our sort of known existing river systems, not all of the little water bodies that I just showed you, um, which were not in our existing databases. and. Uh, many of you are in India, and you can see there's a tremendous uh, set of water bodies, river systems in India, and I'm hoping the Indian community um, really exploits this uh, fully uh, for its capability and, and resources, which is very important, of course, to a country like India. So we're, we're working with um, and, and welcoming help and, and support and utilization from every group um, across the world. So this was an interesting result that I saw um, from Brazil. 
uh, looking at um, uh, using SWOT data to observe um, flooding. And obviously our orbit doesn't allow us to literally track the flooding, although you'll see on a panel coming up, uh, during the one day repeat, we actually had um, the opportunity to, to literally observe uh, a, a sort of a moving flooding event. But um, here you see um, you know, some of the, the, the data that we collected uh, for this um, this area in Brazil um, and uh, the dam overflowed. You can see that on the top right and uh, you can see the extent. And, and of course, more than extent, which you all know, can be, can be measured and received from many different sources, especially optical. Um, it's all about actually producing heights. And that's what, you know, SWAT really, um, I think has the power and, and, and the new data uh, for, for the community in terms of heights, which um, can be used for, um, again, many different applications, including calculating discharge, which is one of our goals, particularly on the river flow systems um, that uh, have, we're working very hard on. So here I mentioned to you about um, actually being able to observe um, a, a flood as it was going. And unfortunately, this was in, uh, in Ukraine with a, a dam breach that took place uh, is relevant during um, the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict. And uh, because we were in the one day repeat, we were actually able to sort of observe that as it transpired and, um, and, and we were able to take some measurements uh, we did not have in situ measurements to compare it with, but uh, we've got lots of in situ measurements in, in plenty of other places that gives us confidence uh, in the results that we've come up with. Here's another example. Um, again, a very challenging water system. So this is in Europe. I think it's the Rhine River. Um, and uh, with lots of um, locks and, and uh, water control and, and changes in uh, the heights, and you can see we, we measure, we get lots of very useful data points. We measure at a very high resolution, and uh, you can see how those measurements change as the locks and, and dam system um, works its way through the, the uh, river system here on the Rhine. Um, here's a very quick view of, as I said, there's lots and lots and lots of results that we're still going through in terms of fully validating the performances, but here's a quick view of um, what some of those results look like. Does it look like this every place, everywhere across the, and, and every water body? Probably not. In fact, I'm certainly, I'm sure not, but um, the ones we have looked at under uh, reasonable environments and, con and configurations, we see very, very good performance that you see here on, on the slide in comparisons with uh, in situ um, data that, that's been collected and matches very, very well uh, to the centimetric level with uh, the SWOT measurements. So, um, you know, some of the things um, that are challenges and, and maybe opportunities for SWOT. So this is uh, another uh, image looking at data from the Mississippi River system. And, you know, we can see where uh, fields are flooded and uh, rainfall happens. And then when it goes back to normal and so forth. And of course, this is interesting for lots of uh, science, lots of applications, but it's also very, very difficult in terms of giving us challenges on the algorithms because we're trying to detect water and we're trying to process and produce particular uh, uh, water products based on those river products based on those. And with applying particular algorithms that are there. So when there are other sorts of uh, topology, topography, um, water um, events that happen, including flooding and irrigation and other things, uh, it does make uh, the standard product processing quite complicated. But on the other hand, gives lots and lots of opportunities for new and uh, additional science and applications. So. Um, you know, now that we've launched SWAT, and I think the mission is performing very well, particularly for the, the core applications that we had in mind, um, there's a lot of interest that people have seen in terms of all kinds of other secondary uh, objectives or uh, and, and applications. I would say objectives translates to goals here in, in all areas, and I'm just going to talk about 
uh, a few specific ones on marine geodesy, of course, looking at um, helping to understand tsunamis and detecting ship detection, DEMs, not something I actually thought would work very well, meaning not just on water heights, but everywhere else. Uh, polar has gotten uh, particularly strong interest from the community in terms of cryospheric science and the performance from SWAT is showing very good results in cryo applications, even in winds. And of course, coastal is something we expected, um, but that is showing extremely good results where we can measure essentially all the way up to the coast, um, which is something we really couldn't do very well with traditional altimetry. So here's a few, um, I would say, snippets of, of, uh, of what's happening in some of those areas. So ship detection was one of them. Um, again, an opportunity for applications. On the other hand, I remember a long discussion on data processing on you know, how do we um, detect and ignore these points to not corrupt some of the data that we had. So we're seeing, of course, lots and lots and lots of ships in, in our data, which um, many people think have, have some good applications for, for various uh, purposes. Uh, another very interesting result I saw was um, on um, bathymetry uh, and, and using the data from SWAT to look at some of the uh, marine uh, topography. And um, one of the experts there, Dr. Sanwell from uh, University of California, San Diego, produced some very interesting results showing thousands of, of uncharted seamounts that SWAT now can chart and, um, and we believe can uh, provide uh, a huge improvement in the existing knowledge uh, globally for uh, bathymetry and marine geodesy as well. So another one was, um, again, we spent a lot of time and money uh, pre-launch in, in working on the hydrology algorithms. And one of the continuous uh, worries and, and discussions and debates was, you know, will, well, will the SWOT measurement work um, in other places that have um, very complex uh, topography, vegetation, et cetera, and, and how well will it work, even though that was not our primary objective. And this was a very interesting result from uh, Tamlin Pavelski at uh, University of North Carolina, where his group looked at uh, data over Florida and, and uh, all sorts of marshy, grassy, muddy, uh, you know, environments and wetlands. And um, at least the first results he showed um, were extremely promising. You can see from the panel on the, on the right there where uh, it's compared uh, in terms of the SWOT data versus gauge level data and uh, the correlation looks extremely good uh, in terms of the results. So we think there's going to be even much, much, much broader application with, uh, with SWOT data. Here's another one on, um, on looking at the cryo applications, particularly on sea ice. Um, we think there's a, a lot of application there and the results look very good and very complementary to other sorts of measurements, uh, including measurements from cryosat, um, that exist in one of the projects I'm working on, Crystal, which is also a dedicated uh, polar mission. So we think SWAT is going to add a lot of, um, of useful knowledge in this field as well. Here's a, a quick look at DEMs that have been produced with SWAT data. Uh, and, and I've seen very interesting ones all over the, the world in lots of different topographies as well. By the way, on the right-hand side was the shuttle radar topography mission, which I mentioned earlier was sort of um, the stimulus and catalyst towards, towards SWAT. So even in comparison to that, um, the results look, look pretty good. Um, in estuaries and uh, estuary bathymetry, the results look extremely good and promising. We think it has a lot of capabilities there. And then we're, we're really thinking um, not only within the project, but within NASA and and with our partners um, to really um, not only look at the, the data from a research uh, perspective, but really trying to work as well as we can uh, and as quickly as we can with applications, with real world applications that, so there's an early adopters team uh, that's been organized for quite some time. It's been difficult for them because ultimately 
without real data, it's hard to, to ultimately uh, work on those applications. Uh, they've got real data now. So the USGS, which is the US, US Geological Survey, is already starting to uh, look at SWOT data uh, and uh, starting to, to process it, utilize it, ingest it, and then of course um, try to use that towards their um, particular op applications. We have a, a nice project I think I saw from uh, IIT Bombay um, with lots, it amazed me on the tremendous numbers of, of river systems um, in India. So I think there's a huge potential for uh, exploitation of this data, particularly uh, in India. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, these projects will be um, fruitful and, and successful and only grow as pathfinders for the future. So uh, I'm just gonna say, wrap up here and say, um, uh, you know, SWAT has, uh, has been very challenging, um, but very exciting. And, um, you know, our objective has always been to work with uh, the global community. And um, none of this can happen without um, the participation support of, of people and partners and organizations all over the world. So uh, I'll end here and, um, and thank you for um, this opportunity and, and take any questions that I might be able to answer. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for, an, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, sir, uh, there are uh, the question session, uh, question and answer session. Uh, at present, uh, one question is there. I'll take up this question. So this question has been asked by uh, Uznir Uzang. Uh, sorry if I have pronounced uh, incorrectly. So the question is, sir, what is the primary function of the SpaceX Falcon 9 in this SWAT mission? And how does it contribute to the overall data processing and distribution system involving JPL and CN CNES? Was the question about SpaceX Falcon 9? Yes, sir. OK, well, I mean, the SpaceX Falcon 9 is purely our launcher. so. Um, you know, the, the only function it has is to get us to space. So it has no other function in terms of um, the mission or mission data return or applications or processing, but simply to get us to space. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'll just ask if there are any other question from the participants, we'll take up, otherwise we'll close the session. Yeah, the lecture was very, uh, very informative, sir. And uh, you have covered uh, everything, the history of Ultimately, and then how it can, it has been used, or it has been used for sea surface height, then its application in uh, the inland waters. Uh, so if there is no other question or uh, query, uh, we, we may end today's session. Thank you so much, sir, uh, once again. And I also Hello. extend my thanks to ISPIR Student Consortium. Yeah, you have any question, uh, Nick? Yes, sorry. I cannot type in yeah, the please, Q and please. A, so I, I just have to, to to ask her live, sorry. Yeah, I uh, just curiosity for the in um, in in satellite, so in orbit uh, capabilities, it's pretty exciting. But is there any, uh, what sort of processor do you have? I mean. Is it potentially customizable from a user perspective? Imagine me that I need some uh, custom made algorithm and absolutely. I ask, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the ground processing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, at, at least um, at, at JPL and I think also at CNES, um, we are working, and I think it's already available for what we call um, on-demand processing. And also, uh, and that doesn't mean just on-demand in the sense of, of uh, you request a particular processing to be done with existing processing, but we also have capability at, 
for where you can actually upload your particular algorithms that you want to, to utilize and use lower level data from the spacecraft. Yes. And do your own version of processing and do it in the cloud because the challenge with SWAT is, is it's very hard to download all of the data and, and, and then do processing and needing a lot of computing power. So we're offering this for the community where not only can you request specific, but you can also upload your own algorithms, apply it in the cloud, apply it to the data that's already in the cloud and have a product that's generated for you. Um, and I'm told it's completely free. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. So the algorithm will be applied to the already taken. Uh... Yeah. So you could you could say, for example, you want to have your own version of your, let me say, level two B processor. You know that you you want, and you can use lower level for lower levels of the data that are available, and have your own version uploaded on the cloud and processed. Exciting. Okay. Thanks so much. So. Yeah, I think I think one of the big things is is really we're producing so much data that um, I think the challenge is going to be on access, on processing, yeah. and and really uh, distribution. So this is something we thought a lot about, particularly on distribution. It's not going to follow, I think, the typical model of just people downloading data all over the place and and so forth. In very small regions, maybe that's that's practical. But particularly, let me call it more power users looking at global sorts of things. It's it's really not practical unless you do it directly on the cloud. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Actually, in of course, fact, I have to add that uh, even uh, we are also processing the SWAT data for uh, the stretch of Ganga River, and we have also achieved very good uh, results using the SWAT data. And we may share our results with you as well. And Absolutely. Uh, we also, yeah, we are also looking forward to this uh, sensor and uh, discharge estimation through these kind of sensors. And uh, uh, I again thank uh, you, sir, on behalf of ISRS and ISPRS community for uh, taking all the pains and taking the lecture in the night or this talk in night uh, as it, it is night at uh, USA. Yes. So thanks once again, sir. And uh, we look yeah. forward for uh, uh, your support in future as well. I'm really excited. Good luck to everybody and uh, uh, have a good, great day. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.